Pharmaceutical giants Pfizer and BioNTech have pledged to deliver 1 billion doses of their COVID-19 vaccine to poorer nations this year and another billion next year. At a G20 summit in Rome on Friday, uh, European countries made their own pledges to donate a combined 100 million doses by the end of the year. Some of those will go to African countries through the COVAX initiative. Now, these commitments come from, will come rather, as global health authorities warned that the world is at a crisis point with the distribution of COVID-19 vaccines. Rich countries have significant access to the vaccines and developing countries are struggling to catch up. Now, in the meantime, the vaccine rollout remains sluggish on the continent where there is not enough supply. So when the southern African nation of Malawi burned nearly 20,000 doses of vaccines this week, it raised a lot of questions, especially because the government's decision to burn the vaccines went against advice from the WHO and the Africa CDC. Both organizations advised Malawi not to destroy COVID-19 vaccines, saying even though they had passed their expiration dates, they were still safe to use. Now, our first report is from the Malawian capital, Lilongwe, where the burning of the vaccines was made a ceremony of sorts. It was an event put on for the cameras. 20,000 doses of Malawi's COVID-19 vaccine allocation laid out to be destroyed. The health minister personally led the exercise to send a message to the public who've been skeptical of the vaccines. As soon as something uh, expires, definitely we take it out. But we have already shown Malawians that we are committed to our policy. We cannot give Malawians any vaccine or indeed any medicine uh, which is expired. We cannot do that. Uh, we, we, we have ethics, uh, we have uh, professionalism, uh, so that cannot happen. Malawi's health experts are also trying to assure the public of the vaccine's safety and efficacy. The vaccine is very safe. It can be given to all people with all sorts of problems, except those that are below 18. Malawi, like many other nations, is short of COVID-19 doses. So far, only a tiny fraction of its 18 million people have been vaccinated. Malawi has reported just over a thousand COVID-19 deaths. The government is having to work hard to convince people to get vaccinated. So that's the situation in Malawi. And now here's uh, the latest update on the progress of the vaccine rollout in the rest of Africa. This data is from the Africa CDC. Now, as the shading you're about to see indicates, most countries on the continent have begun administering vaccines which have been delivered through the COVAX initiative. Uh, the exceptions are Burkina Faso, Chad, Tanzania and Eritrea, where no vaccines have been approved. Now, most countries are using AstraZeneca, but still Africa has the lowest vaccination rate of any continent with less than 1% of the population fully immunized. Now to talk more about the vaccine rollout in Africa, we've invited Professor Christian Hapi onto the program. He is a geneticist and the director of African Center of Excellence for Genomics of Infectious Diseases at Redeemers University in Southwest Nigeria. Welcome to uh, DW News Africa, Professor Hapi. Barely 1% of people in Africa are fully vaccinated. At this rate, when will the continent achieve mass immunization against COVID-19? Uh, thank you very much for inviting me onto the program. I mean, the question you're asking is a very important question. Uh, at this rate, when will we have a mass immunization on the continent? We don't know. I mean, because the, I mean, the African continent is very dependent on the external world. The African continent is very dependent on the vaccines coming from India. India has a big problem at hand right now, and then they are diverting all the vaccine manufactured by the Serum Institute to solve their local problem. Unfortunately, Africa has no vaccine on their own, and then they have really managed, they, what they've done rather is they managed to bungle any effort to develop vaccine for the continent. And unfortunately, we're finding ourselves where we are very vulnerable and probably right. are going to be the only one left in the wood when the rest of the world is out of the wood. Professor, you rightly talked about India there. And, and the question must be asked, are we able to produce vaccines on, on, the, on the continent and to what scale? The answer is no. And the, 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 the truth of the matter is that at the moment, Africa has zero ability to produce any vaccine. So, and as such, you know, we are very dependent on whatever anybody else out there will give us. We are dependent on what 
the, the United States will give us, well, depending on what the, the, the European countries or through uh, the, uh, the, 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 the AstraZeneca platform will give us. So we're very dependent on, on whatever people will have mercy on us and pity us. So and really, it makes us it look it makes us look it makes us look very very vulnerable and very weak. And unfortunately, I mean, and then yet Africa has really managed very well in the first phase and in the second phase of this pandemic. But with the third wave coming on and then with the Indian variant probably spreading over, and then the potential for breakthrough infection even after vaccination, we have really no ability to you know to to protect the largest number of people that we would love to within the shortest time possible. Professor, I do want to talk about a vaccine that, that you've developed, uh, a DNA-based vaccine against COVID-19, which you say showed a 90% efficacy when tested on animals. Uh, why have you not been able to secure funding to take your vaccine to human trials? Uh, simply because African countries are not willing to invest where their mouth is. So they've refused completely to invest in developing and pushing this vaccine forward because it is a culture of begging and waiting for the rest to come to the rescue that is actually predominant here. And it is a shame that a continent of 1.3 billion people, they really not, I mean, have, I mean has the ability, not that they don't have the ability to, 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 uh, to, uh, to develop a vaccine. And even when the African scientists develop that, there is no political will to move it forward. And that is, is a fact. I think between the Africans within the continent, in the academia, and those in the diaspora, I think those can come together and then, I mean, they could come together and develop a vaccine for Africa. But then the truth of the matter is our African leadership, or is African leadership ready to invest and then move those vaccines forward to clinical trials and then demonstrate that it can have some efficacy in order to save African population? The answer is no so far. Professor, what do we need to do? You've talked about third waves uh, on the continent. Uh, we are, of course, looking at the reality that the vaccines that we were dependent on in Africa, the AstraZeneca, because of the disruption uh, in the Indian supply chain, what, what needs to be done and, and who can we call upon to address the situation? The Africans will have to continue to beg and cry as usual. We'll probably just have to call on, on, on those that are producing vaccines to give us whatever that they have left, you know, after they have vaccinated their whole population. The truth of the matter is very, it's going to be very difficult for, you know, for, for Pfizer or Moderna or AstraZeneca to actually produce the numbers that we want in the continent at the moment. So pending that time, we'll probably just have to sit down and start counting our debt. We are lucky that the, 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 the pandemic is not ravaging in Africa. Otherwise, we would have actually been lining down the street. But, um, I mean, fortunately, you know, things are not as bad. But we hope, though, that, you know, that the African leadership will learn from here and then do the right thing so that in the future we don't find ourselves in such a vulnerable situation. All right, that's Professor Christian Hubby talking to us from Nigeria. Thank you, Professor Hubby. Thank you.